Hello and welcome everyone to episode 12 of the IFAT Innovation Talks. Before we start, I would like to remind everyone that today's episode is being recorded and that by joining the event, you agree to the recording taking place and for IFAT to share it on our platforms. As usual, I would like to invite you to visit our event page, to check the speaker profiles, the concept note, and also to check for materials after the event. If you are new to the IFAD Innovation Talks, these are a series of learning and knowledge sharing events lasting an hour where we aim to feature the innovations of IFAD, our partners, and the members of the IFAD Innovation Network. If you're not a member of the IFAD Innovation Network yet and you would like to become a member of the IFAD Innovation Network, please apply in the link that John is sharing with you in the chat right now. The chat will be open at the beginning and at the end of the event, so please feel free to start um, welcoming your friends and tell, let, let us know where you are joining us from. Today, uh, our speakers will be engaging in a dialogue about innovation for impact and how innovation can contribute to improve the lives of rural poor people and help us deliver results in a quicker, better, and more cost-efficient way. The Q&A function is already open, so please feel free to post your questions there. Without much further ado, I am honored to introduce IFAD's president, Alvaro Lario. Alvaro Lario is a seasoned international development finance leader with more than 20 years of experience across academia, private sector asset management, the World Bank Group, and the United Nations including as Associate Vice President of Financial Operations at IFAD. Under his stewardship, IFAD became the first United Nations fund to enter the capital markets and obtain a credit rating enabling IFAD to expand resource mobilization efforts to the private sector. Before joining the fund, the fund in early 2018, Alvaro was the Treasury Capital Markets Lead and Principal Portfolio Officer at the International Finance Corporation which is part of the World Bank Group, where he focused on local capital markets development and emerging market investments. He received a PhD in financial economics from the Complutense University of Madrid after completing a Master of Research in Economics at the London Business School and a Master of Finance from Princeton University. Sharing the stage with him is Alessandra Poggiani, Director of Administration of Human Technopol, Italy's, Italy's International Open Research Institute for Life Sciences. Alessandra is a senior executive and director with ex extensive international experience in the management and development of innovative public and government-owned companies. She is the former director general and CEO of Venice Spa, an in-house ICT company of the city of Venice. And she's also ex-director general of AGIT, Italy's national government digital agency. Before joining Human Technopol, she was Director General and CEO of Light Spa, an in-house ICT uh, company of Italy's Lazio region. She has also been part of the management team at NL Spa, the Euro-Mediterranean Partnership of the European Commission, and the WWF International. Alessandra has also held several academic positions such as visiting lecturer of digital economy at the London Imperial College Business School and adjunct professor of marketing and digital communications at the Università di Roma La Sapienza um, and also at the Università of Venice Ca' Foscari. She sits also in several advisory boards and committees on digital economy, including the International Chamber of Commerce Digital Economy Commission and the advisory board of Italy's innovation group. Alessandra, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much indeed. And please let me just take one second to thank uh, IFAD and all the management of IFAD for giving us the opportunity for this very challenging talk. Um, and without much further ado, I uh, would really like to ask the president of IFAD, considering uh, the important and critical mission you have as if it, the way an organization defines innovation can dramatically shape uh, how its operations and priorities are. So let me start by asking you, how does IFED define innovation and why? Okay. Sorry. 
sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, okay. Thank you very much and uh, very nice to see you all. I think the room is very full, so I'm very happy to see you all here. Uh, many of you are familiar faces and uh, thank you for the invitation, Gladys, and for organizing and to you, Alessandra, for, the, for moderating today. Um, I also come from the academic world and uh, we always try to find definitions and to try to have a big analysis. To me, the most important part would be um, how, in our case for IFAD, we actually develop new products, new services, new approaches that can deliver results on the ground. So actually, how is that transforming and changing the life of the people we are serving? And to me, that's the most important part. Um, how we actually do it, I mean, there's a, there's a, we can talk about, and we will, about the importance of data, the importance of technology, the evidence, and this is a very important part in our business, which is how we learn from the, I would say, the failures that we have had, how we adjust our programs throughout time, and many times how we actually design certain programs or certain projects. And we see that when we come on the ground, we have to basically recreate, innovate, and learn from uh, what things that are not working. So um, I'm especially interested more than on the definition of innovation, what does create a culture of innovation in an organization? So, um, and at the end of the day, that's many times how the leaders, but also the individual staff come together. And for that many times, and also as an economist, probably I think about the incentives. So what encourages, what rewards, what probably supports or stimulates actually staff or people or stakeholders around an organization to come together and have the courage to actually change the current status quo and change how things are being done on the day to day. And many times uh, organizations do not reward that or um, actually think more on the failure than on the actual outcome. And it's many times just the courage of individual people and individual um, staff or individual leaders or executives, supervisors um, who coming together manage to actually uh, produce something that is actually new, but more importantly, that changes or has an impact on how we are delivering in our case for, for the poor people we are serving. Yes, definitely. Very well said. Innovation goes on the legs of people that run and embrace challenging uh, uh, challenges and try to find solution with uh, uh, lateral thinking and new ways of doing things. So let's talk about innovation management for a second. Uh, being that so critical. And for those in the audience who are unfamiliar with the term, innovation management is where a systematic approach is implemented to foster a creative culture in an organization. So it really comes down to people and how people behave in the organization. And this is mostly done when breakthrough ideas uh, are generated on a continuous basis and where large scale and complex objectives are broken down into smaller pieces in details so that the goals are more manageable. Uh, when uh, organizations encourage uh, teams of diverse people with different backgrounds and talents to work on different various problems and try to find a possible solution. So having tried to define very broadly what innovation management means, uh, and based on this, how do you think, Mr. President, that uh, IFED aims to do this and to pursue innovation management within its organization? Thank you. Thank you for your question. So I'll, I'll provide some examples on things that are already ongoing. Some of them are the innovation challenges, the training, the use of uh, omni data, uh, very interesting things that we are currently doing also with technology. And many times we equate technology to innovation, but it's not always the same thing to me. Technology once more is a means to an end. So in that sense, uh, talking about innovation management, um, I would say, and let me start once more, and you'll listen to me say it many times, but I think it's very important. It starts with culture. I, I have, across my career, come from very different cultures. So I started in academia. I went to the private sector. I went to the very cutthroat type of uh, private sector uh, and asset management. I was at the World Bank in a, 
even at the World Bank on the private sector arm vis-a-vis -vis the public sector arm and are completely different cultures on how they approach innovation. Now at the UN, which was obviously a, a shock and an IFAD, even though we are one of the probably more uh, innovative and agile and uh, uh, entities, it's also a very different culture. So I have been transitioning across cultures and many times what happens, and, and I'm a person who especially um, enjoys um, disrupting uh, ways of thinking and, and, and bringing new things on board. So one of the things I have come across, not only here, but throughout the career and also at, at IFAD, is the fact that when you present something new or, or a new way of operating or an innovative, what is considered in the culture an innovative way of operating, the first thing is always rejection. The second thing is pushback. The third thing is this is not the way or this is not how we have done it. The fourth thing you get is this is crazy, it doesn't make sense. Then things start to roll up and things start to work. When things start to work and like with success, many people join. So I think that management of being able to bring the people along is the first part of innovation management. On the examples that uh, I was bringing about training is very important, but training per se does not produce innovation. It creates knowledge, but knowledge is not innovation. So, so an important part of it once more is part of the culture on how or how people actually come to be able to offer their ideas and to be able to push against the established issues. Innovation challenge is a good way, it's a safe way for an institution to produce some, some changes on certain areas. And that's what I think Gladys and the team have been very well doing, supporting some of the ideas that feel safer at the very local level of the institution, how to scale them up and make them happen at many other areas. So I think innovation challenges are a good way. And when we talk about technology, I think nowadays it's very difficult with what we are seeing on artificial intelligence, chat GPT and many other areas, not to talk about technology, but technology, let me first start saying once more that technology is not necessarily innovation, it's what you do with it. So for example, we have developed Omni data and how we analyze, how we, uh, evaluate how we produce data and how we bring it together. That's an important part, but like with artificial intelligence, that's only one part of the equation. What you do with it is part of the innovation. The innovation starts there. The same with other examples with uh, geographical, with GIS type of systems. Um, and we can talk later on, on on other examples. But I think in our case, the most important part is how we use that technology to actually serve the people on the ground and change their lives in a way that the challenges that they have become easier. I think that's part of what we need to think when we are innovating, not for the sake of it. Absolutely. And uh, because of that, I would like for a second to go back to uh, the critical mission of IFAD. As you said, technology is only a means to an end and innovation is something we strive because we want to accomplish the mission of the organization we work and because of the importance, the strategic importance for the well-being of so many people that the missions of IFAD brings with it. Uh, it's very important that you, as the president of IFAD, uh, gives, uh, give, give, give an indication of how you intend for mm -hmm. IFAD to leverage on innovation to accomplish its goals. So what would you say about that? So oh, thank you. Um, I would say that uh, parts of it, of the elements I was describing, I mean, obviously one part, the most important part is people, also technology. To put some examples of things that we're already doing with GIS, for example, we have been uh, defending the development of rice paddies in, in Sierra Leone in a way that this has also been a way of measuring that actually that way it has led to fewer fires. I think that's an important, for example, element of how using technology and being able to um, support some of the results and the impact that we are having on the ground. Another one I can think of is the transparency of funds. Clearly one of the issues in development and how the funds from donors or from the private sector are deployed into our projects is uh, the transparency of those funds. And uh, one thing we also pioneered was in, in Kenya and the blockchain solution in order to trace the funds of how they are coming into, the, into their use. Um, so all of that at the end, once more, it's a, it's a matter of the culture of risk-taking of the institution, of the maturity in terms of the 
of how it accepts the, the ideas and also how it collaborates and how it cooperates with other institutions. I think that's a key part. It's very important. One of the things that I believe that I have learned more jumping from sector or area to area is actually how to think on different mental models from different um, challenges that I've had throughout my career. And I think the, the same can be said about learning institutions. There's, there's all of this theory also very academic about the learning organizations. Um, more than the learning organizations, once more, I believe in people and I believe in culture. And I think that's what determines actually what the organization itself is, is able to do. So for me to collaborate and to partner with institutions that are at the cutting edge or more forefront of things that we do not do as well is very important for us to see how they do it, for our staff to be able sometimes to come from these institutions or to be able to, to be in that in or to have a stint or to, to have a, a, a small contact with that institution. So with whom we partner is also a very important part. The mentality and that collaboration is, is also how I think innovation comes across. And uh, again, thanks for your reply because it brings again the importance uh, of the human factor uh, into innovation and collaboration and partnership and finding the right partners is, uh, is absolutely uh, a, a human critical factor in, uh, uh, in, in the success of any uh, innovation and of any innovative uh, way of thinking and way of proceeding for each organization. But um, stemming from what you've said and some of the examples that you have uh, uh, detailed before, I was wondering, uh, thinking in a more medium term, in three years' time, uh, what will success look like uh, for innovation at IFED? What do you think will be the proof or the evidence that IFED has been successful in bringing about innovation in its field? So um, once more, and uh, perhaps referring, as you mentioned, to the previous uh, statements or the previous uh, thoughts I had, for us, the most important part is the impact and impact and how we define impact is very relevant too. So for us, impact is not only what's happening right now, but actually what's happening in the long-term sustainability of the lives we're changing. That is not a one-off. We're not in the humanitarian business. So we're in the development business. And we need to make sure that this creates uh, medium and long-term changes. Recently, I was talking with a person, with a CEO of a development bank who actually knew a project of uh, IFAD 30 years ago, and he came back 30 years later, and he saw that many of the results were still ongoing. To me, that's the biggest proof of actually how innovation is changing the lives of people. That means that it was not only relevant then, but it's also relevant now. So, so, and it has been sustained throughout time. So I think that's a very important component of what I would like to see as a president, that the innovation is not a one-off. It's not something that actually is changing right now, but that over time is something that the impact is long lasting. Another important part, uh, which is very key for IFAS is actually that this innovation in the programs we are doing is also targeting the people we want to target. So it's not just innovation for the sake of it, but actually targeting in this case, we're very much focused on the, uh, on women, we're very much focused on youth so that the innovations also apply to them, that they are not just theoretical or on a document, but actually that they are changing the lives of the target people and the target populations that we want to have. Yes, and um, I was um, thinking about the reference you made to the fact that you that IFED is a financial institution that aids and wants to promote uh, innovation and development that is self-sustainable. And because of that, I imagine that what uh, a critical aspect is also to make people on the field being able to foster the innovation that you bring about, the funds and the, the aids that you bring about and uh, give, give a chance for them to work and foster that and be self-sustainable. Uh, because of that, I think that uh, one uh, aspect uh, that would be important to, to uh, explore here with you 
is how do you imagine that this self-sustainability can be fostered? And innovation is obviously part of that, but not only. And how can innovative uh, solutions can be brought about in different countries with very different situations and variables and be at the same time useful and relevant for the people in the field? That's a very good question. I think it also relates to the prioritization of what we do and how we see ourselves as an institution. We cannot innovate and we cannot focus in all areas. So what is very clear and is part of the discussions we're having right now at the, at the replenishment that we are having as a replenishment fund this year is that the type of innovations we are looking for need to obviously have an impact in building sustainable and resilient food systems. That's the, the first one. And we have seen the, the importance of it uh, throughout the food crisis and currently also including on the self-reliance that many countries are, are looking for in terms of, of their own production and also agriculture productivity. And many of these solutions actually many times come from people in the field. I mean, when we work many times with indigenous people, we find many of their solutions innovative, but they have been doing them for many years and they, they especially work with nature and with nature-based solutions, which in other parts of the world might be seen as something very innovative. So I think that's very important for us also in terms of the priorities, I would say working in very fragile context, being able to finance many of our key theme areas, which are climate use, gender and nutrition, but very much also seeing that the world is becoming much more fragile and many of the countries and the conflicts uh, that they are going through um, are accelerating and we're seeing many more conflicts and that needs to also make us think on what type of in this case innovation in our business model or how we approach the design of our projects needs to change with an evolving world and how we adapt so to me innovation is not only just for the sake of innovation once more but how do we adapt to a changing context and to a changing landscape. And I think that's what we have to think as an institution. Well, thank you. And uh, I do think that is very true. And I also think it's a bit of a cultural bias sometimes, especially from academia, to think about innovation as something that can be just brought or something which is top down or something that is inherently new. Sometimes innovation are found in traditions uh, that we simply don't know. Uh, sometimes research needs to be done on the field because only people working in certain environments and in certain circumstances have the keys and resources and uh, uh, intellectual and cognitive tools to uh, do the research that is actually suitable to resolve a certain problem rather than another. So again, thanks for your previous uh, comments about cooperation, because this kind of innovation, I believe, can only be brought about if it's an innovation that comes from the collaboration of different sides, looking at the problems with different angles. And when financial aid and support meets the traditional knowledge of people working uh, from a long time, into a certain environment and with certain circumstances to cope. And that's where really, when these two things together happen, I think that is where innovation uh, can be not just uh, something new happening, but something new happening to get really a solution for the problem we have, which I suppose is what we all strive for. So thanks a lot for um, putting these two concepts of collaboration and innovation together, I think it's very important. And uh, to, to carry on our dialogue and perhaps reach uh, uh, some uh, more conclusive uh, ideas of what will be your uh, guidance and leadership in the IFED uh, organization and innovation. Um, can you please share with us how is IFED planning to monitor and evaluate the progress you will be doing by pursuing uh, all these different objectives that you've listed before and in the spirit that we were talking about of innovation together with innovation management and cooperation? 
Yeah, so perhaps before I answer, reflecting on, on what you just mentioned on connecting, perhaps what I would like to share is many times people do believe in innovation as an abstract thing, as you said, the very top down. Actually, many times innovation is just connecting the dots. So for example, in the case of IFA, this has meant becoming the first United Nations agency to have a credit rating, which in other spheres would be something very normal. This is something that was discussed for perhaps 10 years at IFA, but to make it happen, it's going to be uh, something uh, much more uh, complicated. Just to answer very briefly on your question, um, I think for us, it's very important to link uh, all of our impact to results. So that means we have a results management framework. We have a sustainable development finance framework whereby each of our projects is linked to a specific SDG and we measure it and are able to report it. So I think that the uh, ability to use data and m &E systems to, to be able to report on how it translates in our case into impact is very important. So I would expect that to continue. Also the training, what we, the way we're working in terms of uh, capacity building and adoption of the UN Innovation Toolkit. So I think there's a, a lot of things that are ongoing. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Andrea. Andrea thank you so much, uh, Mr. President, for uh, a very uh, insightful uh, dialogue between the two of you. Now I'd like to start taking some questions from the audience here at the Italian Room in IFAT, but also from our audience in, in Zoom. So um, unless we have any questions right now from the room, uh, Francesca, please go ahead. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, Francesca, can you please turn on your microphone? Can you hear me? Yeah. Hello, thank you very much for this insightful fight chat. Um, I'm a consultant in the program management department here at IFAD and um, Sandro Pertini fellow at Johns Hopkins I is in Washington DC. I have a question for the president of IFAD. So you mentioned that um, for you, the human factor is very important in the innovation process. And so um, I was wondering, in your opinion, what is the role of the HIFAD uh, young staff, including consultants and intern, uh, interns in this process? Are you considering in the future some focus groups? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, actually, the way I see it is, would you offer or would you suggest to have some focus group? I don't think it needs to come from myself, but probably from yourselves. In the case of how do I see interns and, and the ways many times uh, after being in the workforce for 20, 30 years, many of the professionals actually love to have many of the new ideas from young people and interns. At the same time, I understand because I've also been there the frustration from many of them that they are not adopted right away or that they don't have all the resources, all of the bureaucracy of our organization. So how to come together between the new ideas and the refreshed ideas. So my only ask to many of the young people who come into the workforce or into IFA would be to continue pushing, to insist in, to try to influence, to make the way around, to make things happen. The difficulty is not having an idea. The difficulty is making it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca, and thank you, Mr. President. Um, actually, uh, Francesca, on that, uh, we, we do have the IFAT Youth Network, and some reps uh, of the network are here, and they're doing a fantastic job exactly doing that, pushing for, for innovation. So I, I'm sure that they will be more than happy to listen to your ideas. So let's go now to the questions from Zoom. We have um, the question has, that has been most voted on Zoom is, why doesn't IFAT support disruptive African innovators with pilot grants? to demonstrate and grow farmer co-created innovations that work for African smallholder farmers. And this question comes from James. So uh, uh, Mr. President, that's, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. Thank you very much. So actually we do that, but we do it through our governments. I mean, our way of operating for 40 years has been through public sector coordination and financing. In the last four or five years, we started also with private sector financing. It's interesting that it mentions on grants. There's a grant, regular grant program, but obviously it's a scarce one. One of the challenges that uh, any institution faces is on how it uses our the scarce resources that you have on grants to scale it up. So how much can you, for example, use a grant to mobilize money from the private sector to scale it up to an extent where you are, instead of impacting 100 people, impacting 100,000 people. And that's one of the difficulties. The, the financing is extremely scarce. It's very difficult to get grant financing so that we could do it in an individual basis. Indeed, we'd have a lot of programs whereby we have cooperatives of 20, 50, 100 women 
But um, I would say the challenge is how to make that happen at a scale whereby it can be sustainable and impact as many people as we can. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Uh, the next question comes from Andrea Jeremica. He is uh, the Director General of the European Institute of Innovation for Sustainability. The question is, uh, under the innovation umbrella, what is your vision of the engagement with the private sector and more specifically um, on venture capital? Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Very interesting. Um, I, I think that goes beyond the innovation. That's more on the strategic front of how IFAD uh, wants to operate with the private sector. One of the issues with venture capital is that, as the previous question, probably the main interest of venture capital would be on how can IFAD de-risk many of these investments. To de-risk the investments, you need to want more grant financing. Grant financing is scarce. So um, that would be a way. We are actually, and we have done that, used to part of our grant financing to work with an impact fund, with the ABC fund to de-risk it and to be able to actually have very small tickets of 50,000 upwards to a million dollars and to be able to, to do some of it. It's difficult to do it at a massive scale. We're also working with other institutional investors with a pension fund to see how we can support them in on the ground on deploying funds. Venture capital, I would say it's a very different sector and most of the I would say ability to partner with them would lie probably on IFAT de-risking or providing grant financing, which, as I said, is, is very scarce. Thank you. Um, the next question is not really related to innovation per se. Uh, the question comes from uh, Sudan, and they would like to know how IFAT is supporting peace building and sustainability organizations. It's a good question. So there's uh, there's other UN agencies which actually are focused on peace building. From our side, the way that we believe our mission is, is to provide opportunities on the ground and job creation to people who actually don't have those opportunities in the rural areas. For us, that's the main way of avoiding conflict, the main way to avoid forced migration and to provide these people with the opportunities, the knowledge and the capacity to sustain their lives and and to be able to do it also without us. So we do it in terms of the development we do, but we are not a specialized agency on, on peacekeeping per se. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is for both of you. Um, so it's, uh, you mentioned women and youth as a specific target for your programs, that these are the IFAD programs. Do you have any lessons learned, good practices in terms of innovation solutions, which are also inclusive for persons with disabilities? Um, Hold on, because the questions are moving. Um, yeah, persons with disabilities and which proved effective in making their life easier and in a sustainable way. Um, if you could, if you if you could please uh, share any examples on on this. Thank you. So let me perhaps start with the disabilities. I don't know, Alison, if you want to come in and to on the disabilities. Actually, we have just. Uh, gotten uh, approved uh, this last year's uh, our disability strategy uh, on the programs we work in. We recently showed some of our programs uh, to our executive board in one of our videos. I think they're available also online, but this is, has been also a, a priority over the last years. Women and youth, we have more of an experience over the last decades, I would say. In some of the geographical areas, some of our programs even do 100% of youth. And you can imagine why, I mean, in many of the countries in Africa, youth represents 70, 80% of the actual population. So many times that's why job creation and giving these opportunities is, is so important for us. And women, we know many times they actually, what they are lacking is the access, the resources, the voice in their own communities. And many times when you see the changes on the ground in terms of how they are able to to bring the income, to have the voice, to be part of the community that also changes their stance many times and their ability to, to influence in, in their own community. So that's also a big priority for us. Thank you so much. Uh, let me go. Yeah, Alessandra, I was going to ask um, you. It's very interesting because obviously, since innovation is usually very much associated with technology, novelties, uh, sometimes uh, it does seem detached to uh, individual disabilities or individual uh, hindrance that prevent people to, to strive at their best. 
but obviously uh, both technology and especially technology when applied to agricultural processes or agricultural uh, industry and rural development can overcome a lot of uh, disability problems that people in the field might have uh, and preventing them in having a job or having a fulfilling uh, in industrial uh, opportunity or even being entrepreneurs. So obviously, the more we use uh, innovations and in this case, technological innovation to uh, overcome uh, obstacles, even physical obstacles that people might have in pursuing their career, their job, their uh, economic flourishing, uh, the more we use innovation to make disabled people uh, being part of their community fully, uh, both in agricultural development, considering uh, IFAD mission, but in general for uh, employment, occupation and economic development. Thank you so much, Alessandra. Uh, we have a uh, uh, somehow tough question from the audience that Geoffrey is asking about the duality of IFAD being a sort of hybrid organization and being both a poverty reduction development agency and an international financial institution. So he would like to learn how IFAD is going to be managing this duality uh, in its mandate in the future. Thank you very much. Well, actually, we have been for a long time both uh, aspects, so we yeah. have been managing quite well. Um, I would say IFAD is a loss-making institution. So IFAD uh, main aim is not to uh, have a certain amount of net income like you would have at a bank or even a multilateral development bank. That's one of the challenges as well as at the same time some of the of the advantages. Um, we provide both grants as well as very concessional funds. So now that interest rates are rising, we actually provide extremely concessional funds and for 30, 40 years, so actually for a very, very long time, because actually many of these uh, countries are in a development journey over time. Indeed, we're very happy when some of these countries go from uh, borrowing at very, very uh, concessional rates to much higher rates, because that means that they have gone from being a normally a low income country to a middle income to an upper middle income. And that's what we would like to see more and more many of these countries actually developing. So for us, it's not a dual mandate. Our mandate is poverty reduction. Our mandate is development of uh, the rural areas, very specifically in low-income and middle-income countries with a very much of a focus on low-income. So there are operations, 90% of them are in low-income and low-middle-income countries. So our focus is very clear. Correct. And actually, that is uh, our strength to be able to offer financing and uh, for the projects in, in, in our partners as well. So I'm going to give the floor now to Enrico Molinaro, who is uh, in the Italian room. Enrico. Thank you. And my name is Enrico Molinaro, but uh, I'm here also representing the Italian civil society in an organization of 42 countries, the Andalin Foundation, who is led by a Spanish uh, executive director. And in the Complutense Universia de Escorial, I got the idea that uh, we developed uh, Lately, on December 3rd, uh, at the Med Dialogue with uh, uh, Joe Puri in the panel uh, <clears throat> with Palestinians and Israelis, because you said connecting the, the dots, the idea is to relate IFAD uh, goals with other institutions. Very clear what you said. But then, what is the idea that we discuss also in a panel that we organize uh, thanks to the uh, help of, of Gladys here at IFAD last year? at the interinstitutional level. Something which is a paradox, innovation and tradition. So your grand-grandmothers uh, develop some habits of balance between the different components of the food that are still relevant today uh, to face you know, all the problems of the immunological system. You know that we are going to face a problem with the antibiotics in the coming future and not, talk, not only about the, the COVID problem. So our project that uh, was the center of the th uh, third World Conference on, for Mediterranean Diet, uh, tries to get, go back, get back to these uh, balanced ideas 
that are also more natural, in order to give innovation uh, that is still relevant today. I cannot elaborate now for lack of time, but it's a provocation for you because I hope, and, and we discussed with Alessandra before, I thank you for your kind attention, this idea that could be one point to connect with other dots in an interinstitutional vision of the IFAD mission. That's a, that's a pretty complex thought. Um, having said that, I think one of the issues that we are seeing globally is that in terms of diets, we see 3 billion people having unhealthy diets. The type of data that we are having every day, it's not only the poor people who have food insecurity, which are in the 800, 900 million, but actually poor diets across the globe are 3 billion people who are having uh, unhealthy diets. So that's uh, that's something that uh, for us, it's, it's very important. We very much focus much more probably on the development side um, and more on the poverty aspect, but it's true. For example, I was meeting right now with the president of the Caribbean Development Bank and obviously in the Caribbean and in many of the small state islands, one of the issues they have is the import. They import a lot of the food that is not very healthy food. They do not grow it themselves. Much of it is also on a cultural basis. So I, I do agree that there's a lot of elements there. Um, for an institution like IFA, that's one of our main challenges, actually. And there's a lot of talk whether we should be focusing on nutrition, on food systems, on the value chain, on the productivity, on the. So um, for us, as I said, the most important part is actually, I do believe that we are an institution that focuses on food systems and food systems, not even many times agriculture. It also relates to infrastructure. It relates to energy. So um, that aspect on how we develop rural areas, which is our aim as such, our mission, has many components. And some of them, I, I think you have brought them up, but uh, that's part of the conundrum, yeah. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Alessandra, the question, uh, the next question is for you. The audience would like to learn how research and evidence can contribute to innovation in the context of the human technopole. Very interesting question, and, and a question is very difficult to answer in a few minutes. Uh, in human technopole, uh, we are focused on life sciences, so biology, structural biology, genomics, uh, neurogenomics. Uh, a lot of that is also computational uh, biology. Uh, nowadays, even hard uh, science is very much linked with IT and with computational capacity. But obviously life sciences uh, at the bottom of it has to do with the well-being of people. And the well-being of people is very much connected with uh, agricultural development, uh, fighting against poverty, health. Health is really important and health is connected with nutrition, with life habits, but also with the opportunities uh, and the ways in which, in each situation, local communities engage with their reality. So at the moment, we uh, have a very numerous uh, range of programs, uh, some connected with uh, genomic sequencing, also in connection with uh, diets, health and food, but not only. Uh, and each program bears with it the opportunity of bringing data and information that are relevant for giving hints to people that do development on how to best pursue a certain development in a certain area, considering the different situation, the different environments, the different type of population and demographic. So I do believe that research is essential, is an essential part of the data gaining that should be uh, the background information and prologue of each kind of development initiative, even more so if we want that to be um, an innovative initiative, uh, if we take uh, the stand that innovation is not only something fancy that we label innovation because it's new, but it's innovative because it's a different way of doing something based on hard data. And those hard data, uh, most of the time, uh, come from research and uh, 
perhaps uh, we should invest in that a bit more because when it comes from research and from evidence, uh, we can be, if not sure, more sure or more confident that our initiative will lead to positive solutions. Absolutely. That uh, um, I don't know if you want to reply somehow to that, but uh, I think that that was a quite complete answer. And thank you so much, uh, Alessandra. Um, yeah, definitely decision making uh, based on research and, and evidence has a higher potential to to deliver better results. The, ne the next question is uh, about impact. Um, Marcel Scana is asking, talking about impact, and I would like to, we have also some representatives from IFAS Research and Impact Division here in case that they also want to come and join in, in, the, in the answer. Um, can you elaborate how accurately you measure impact based on an example? Yes, I can, I can try to do so under the purview of the Director of Research and uh, Impact Assessment. So for us, I mean, we, it's very important that we are able to show the results and the impact of the work we do. Um, as I said, we have a results management framework whereby we report to our executive board on the results we have, and we have certain commitments over a certain period of time. At the same time, we in each of our projects, we also try to um, measure and link it to a specific SDG so that we can also report to, to our investors. On the specifics of the example, I mean, uh, once a project is finalized, we have an, what we call an impact assessment where, where we collect the data and thereby we see uh, what are the targets where we have achieved them or not. We do that on 15%, one five of our projects, and then we attribute it to the entire portfolio because obviously there's not enough money to do all of the projects and all of the stages. So actually what we do is we take a sample that is representative of the entire portfolio of certain projects. We measure there the results ex ante, ex post of the, once the project has intervened, we compare it with other type of populations that uh, actually have not gone through the same process to see whether it's meaningful or not. And then we attribute it to the rest of the portfolio. So I hope that was more or less, uh, I see the director nodding. So it seems it's an all right answer. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Um, the next question was uh, somehow, I, th I feel it was somehow uh, answered during the fireside chat, but uh, we have uh, people voting the question uh, a lot. So maybe they uh, they need a, a bit more of emphasis. So let me just go ahead and ask the question. What will be IFAD's core priorities to foster and support innovation in different countries around the world? Most specific, more, more specifically, the developing countries which lack funds to support their innovation ideas. As I said, you already addressed this question, but maybe uh, reinforcement of, of the answer. Thank you, Noya. I, I think I, I went through the core priorities. One of the last parts of the question was more financing and many times that's one of the issues we have we do have uh, also an approach and certain facilities on south south triangular cooperation whereby we also see how certain of the practices in in the southern hemisphere can also be replicated in, in other parts of the world and that's an important part of how we also try to innovate and transfer that technology thank you so much um the, the next question has to do with um just give, just give me a second so that I can go to the most voted one. From your perspective, what will be the future like in terms of development finance, taking into account the uncertainties that the world is facing right now? Well, that's a very big question indeed. Um, for anyone who's interested, I would encourage them to look at the I think it's public, or at least it's leaked or public, the latest World Bank report that they have had at the end of the last year in December, whereby um, the main donors or the main countries in the world are looking at how multilateral institutions should be financing common public goods. Mm -hmm. So one of the concerns that uh, a lot of people are expressing is that actually many of these multilateral institutions, which were set up um, 70, 80 years ago, or less 60, 70 years ago, actually are not serving to the current needs in terms of common public goods, and more specifically in terms of the current climate change challenge that we have. So um, they're asking many of these institutions to actually change the way they're operating, see how can they can engage much more of the private sector. And one of the things that is clear, and if you look at the data and the financing out there, 
is that even these multilateral institutions and in general official development assistance, ODA, is very small compared to other type of flows like foreign direct inflows um, to these countries. Even remittances are many, many times bigger than actually what any of these multilaterals or ODA provides. So I think there's a lot of uh, flows in the system on how many of these uh, common public goods need to be financed. And there's a lot of rethinking by the entire system in terms of, and let me put you an example, and it's very public, and you, you can see the prime minister of, uh, of one of the islands, um, Mia Fodli, um, saying they have become right now uh, in Barbados uh, a uh, middle-income country. So actually none of the big multilateral institutions do finance their climate change fight. They have a lot of needs, but actually it's not finance. So if they have to go to the markets or to the public there to finance it, it would be extremely high the cost. So they have this challenge, which is not provoked or done by themselves, but they are getting the consequences of climate change, especially in a small state island and many other effects, including nutrition that we discussed before and other. So how do these institutions or the multilateral community engage with them, finance them and support them. So there's an ongoing conversation. Obviously, IFAD is part and will be part of these conversations, but it's not anymore about low income. It's many times low income countries. It's also about this. How do we finance as a, as a world, the many of these common challenges and global public goods, very much related could be pollution. It could be health. We are seeing it with the virus. It could be also in this case, also climate change. And there's an ongoing conversation. So for any of you that is actually interested, I would encourage you to continue engaging, reading, and, and participating in these matters. Thank you, Mr. President. The next question is from Simone Sala from um, one of IFAD's partners, Jenga Lab. He's asking, how do you see the role of IFAD on innovation within the UN framework? That's... Uh... I would say a very uh, challenging question because I mean, IFAD is part obviously of the UN system. We are a specialized agency. We're an independent specialized agency and we do have a lot of uh, common touching points and ways that we have been working. Obviously the UN uh, toolkit is one of them. We have had also innovation challenges that Larry has been also been participating. I'm sure that uh, she can also comment on this. But I see it more. Uh, I, I see it more difficult on innovating on a global entire system composed by many institutions, rather than focusing, as I said at the beginning, on how IFAD in particular can change the lives of people on the ground and what are the innovations needed for that. I, I'm very much a very concrete and pragmatic person, so that's the type of thoughts I am trying to to come about. Thank you so much, uh, um, Simone. Uh, being a partner, you know that uh, we are working hard to uh, increase the amount of ideas that we are supporting, the origination of ideas, but also making sure that we are financing all the stages of uh, innovation from incubation to um, the testing, the piloting, and scaling up those ideas that prove to be successful. So that's that's um, uh, part of the work that we are doing. But as um, the president said, the um, uh, previous, previously in the Fireside chat, one of the strategic advantages of IFAD is the knowledge, the very specific knowledge that IFAD has uh, of uh, rural areas of our participatory approaches, and that combined with the uh, development, the development of capacity and the financing that IFAD is able to provide. Let me move to the to the next question. We have five, still five minutes left, so we have about uh, three more minutes to to answer other questions. And um, this. This question comes from Anne Mary, and she would like to know how she says that she's very much interested in uh, your comments about traditional knowledge. And she would like to know how the organizations are able to support the, um, um, you know, indigenous knowledge, indigenous innovations, the, those innovations that are already there or that are how to uh, support also the origination of those ideas that are in the field. Thank you. So if she's interested, I would encourage her to also participate. We have an Indigenous Peoples Forum every two years. It's coming now in February in Rome. So if she's interested, I think that's a very good way of seeing how where um, all of this uh, many times the dialogue comes together. In the case of the IFAD specific projects, I mean, the, as you mentioned, Gladys, the participatory approach is very important. So how to actually encourage many of this knowledge. And I 
And many times, to be very frank, it's not very easy because many times governments are not always necessarily very conducive. So bring making sure that the voices and the knowledge is part of how we design the projects for us is very important. So bringing the people into the equation and actually the people who many times are the ones we are serving should be also the ones driving many of the design of these projects, putting out their needs. So that's part of how we can op how we do operate and a very important part for me of how we target and also on the way that we work. Because not obviously much bigger institutions like multilateral development banks do not have this participatory approach. They think on big projects and they talk about big financing, but they are not on the ground necessarily on this participatory approach. That's very important for us. And it's a very, to me, it's a competitive advantage. And it's part of why governments really appreciate the work we do now and 40 years ago. So I think that's a, something that, that has to remain and will be a very important pillar for IFAD. Thank you so much, Mr. President. We, we in fact, have some IFAD colleagues here joining us that uh, uh, I don't know if uh, you would like to contribute anything on the question about uh, indigenous knowledge, Antonella. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And uh, this links also to the question on how IFAD contributes to innovation in the UN. Um, and um, uh, well, IFAD uh, has advanced uh, the dialogue with indigenous peoples and is a champion in this and the uh, updated policy on engagement with indigenous peoples approved uh, last December by the executive board brings um, an important innovation for the UN whereby indigenous peoples now are recognized as observers at the executive board in the governance of IFAD. And these together with the indigenous peoples forum that the uh, president just mentioned is another big innovation uh, for which uh, indigenous peoples and the UN has been uh, uh, applauding IFAD. The other innovations on traditional knowledge come from the participatory approach, comes from the indigenous peoples co-creating and co-leading uh, the projects on the ground. Uh, these uh, uh, also emerges with one of the another innovation, uh, which is a dedicated fund to indigenous peoples at IFAD. It is the Indigenous Peoples Assistance Facility, uh, whereby indigenous peoples communities and their organizations submit their projects uh, and they implement them. Uh, so innovations happen at different level, from the innovations on the ground based on, the tra on their traditional indigenous peoples knowledge uh, up to how and the modality and the methodology we work with indigenous peoples. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Antonella. I am aware of the fact that we have many more questions in the chat on Zoom, and I, I have seen a couple of uh, hands raised here, but unfortunately we have run out of time and we must conclude uh, today's event. I would like to um, thank our speakers uh, today, the audience here, the audience uh, on Zoom, but I would like to also mention some people that have been fundamental to be able to deliver today's event. Carmela Lopez, Julia Scamaca, John Lerd, and Catherine Beck, Manavi Pereira, Grecia Bernardini Marino, Francesca Realacci, and Unluk Beck Abarok. Thank you so much for all the support. I would also like to thank uh, our IFAD colleagues for contributing to the content of today's innovation talk and uh, to the contributions also from the floor today. And I would like to invite you to participate in the call for proposals for the next innovation talks. So please reach us at innovation at ifat.org with your proposals of what you would like to see next. And if you would like to be part of a panel, please do let us know. Um, last but not least, a huge and a special thanks to IFAD's communication department for um, our, the, the dissemination efforts and for all our partners here for being with us today. Thank you so much. See you next time at the next innovation talk. Goodbye.